With a trembling hand, he threw a handful of soil into the grave. Mulaney clung to him and cried. Despite the grandmother's advising against it, he decided to bring his daughter to the funeral. She held up well. After all, she was already seven years old and had to say goodbye to her mother. Oliver stepped away and stood aside. His daughter hugged him and stared blankly at the grave. People approached, threw soil, and left. At some point, he detached himself from everything, stared ahead, and saw nothing. A ringing filled his ears. He heard nothing else. His mother-in-law approached and tugged at him. Her mouth moved, but Oliver couldn't understand. Ollie, the elderly woman, seemed to be addressing him for the umpteenth time. He shook his head. Let's go. People are already boarding the bus. I'll catch up later. Oliver sighed. You? His mother-in-law started and fell silent. All right. She was a strong woman. Always had been. She held herself together in public, but Oliver knew she would cry at home. Melanie, let's go. Dad will catch up later. His daughter left with her grandmother. He stood still for a while until he heard the noise of a car. Oliver looked around. The grave diggers had already loaded their shovels into a vehicle and were leaving. No one was around, just a fresh grave next to others long past. Emma's mother had reserved a spot for herself to be buried next to her husband, but they had to bury their daughter first. Still so young, barely over forty. Oliver pulled a small camera from his pocket and attached it to a tree at the neighboring grave. He had spotted it right away. The view would be perfect, focused directly on his wife's grave. It might have been a foolish idea, but he wanted to be near her a bit longer. He had been distraught since her death. He bought the camera as a toy to use at their country house. He and Melanie had planned to record nighttime videos. Maybe they would capture a hedgehog or someone else. They hadn't had a chance to do anything yet. It was an impulsive desire. He decided to let it stay for a couple of days before moving it. He didn't even know what he expected to see. He just needed to be with her. The wake passed in a haze. Friends, relatives, food, wine, some stupid condolences, as if they made it any easier for him. He craved silence not wanting to see anyone or be seen with pitying eyes, not wanting to hear attempts to squeeze out words that were clearly not going to help. Silly formalities. All these congratulations and sympathies, cliched phrases that could fill a book, words to hang in the air. Then his mother-in-law said something dryly. She, of course, understood that words wouldn't help here. She wanted to get home quickly, and grieve her daughter's death. But she wouldn't, of course. She took Melanie with her. With her granddaughter, she would find the strength to go on, which is why she had taken her in the first place. Oliver didn't object. He couldn't do anything now. It was better for the girl to stay with her grandmother. He apologized, got in the car, and drove away. He circled around the city until it got dark. He would have continued, but he remembered the camera. Arriving home, he immediately turned on the laptop, set up the live stream, and stared at the screen as if expecting something, but there was nothing. If it weren't for the faint breeze, it would have looked like a regular photo, darkness and silhouettes of graves, lit by the full moon. He then lay down on the couch, placing the laptop on the floor. He watched and tried to fall asleep. Periodically closing and reopening his eyes, he couldn't sleep, and nothing was happening on the screen. He didn't really expect anything. It was just something to do. He began to doze. Sleep was poor. He fell asleep and woke up intermittently. He flinched from images appearing while falling asleep. He looked at the monitor, then slipped back into a doze. At some point, he opened his eyes again and saw a woman with flowers on the screen. He closed his eyes, thinking it was a dream, and immediately flinched. He nearly fell off the couch, scrutinizing the image. Indeed, there was a strange woman at the cemetery. He looked at the clock. It was half past one in the morning. Sleep vanished instantly. He sat up and leaned closer to the monitor. 
He didn't believe in the supernatural. The woman was very much alive. It was strange, of course. Maybe someone hadn't had time to say goodbye to the body. But why at night? Oliver recalled who had been at the funeral. All of Emma's close friends were there. There was no one else who would need to come to the cemetery in such a hurry at night, and the woman was right by his wife's grave. Then the woman turned her face to the camera, and the man froze in shock. They looked each other in the face, although she probably didn't know she was looking at the camera, but Oliver was looking at the face of his deceased wife. It was Emma, whom he had buried today. He knew for sure that his wife was in the coffin. Of course, before the funeral, her face had been made up to conceal the traces of the accident. But it was her. And now, judging by her appearance, she was alive and well. It was definitely his wife. He couldn't mistake her for anyone else, even in this poorly lit place. Her posture, slightly stooped. Her habit of adjusting her hair, even though it was now covered with a headscarf. Oliver had no doubts that it was her. His brain feverishly kicked into gear. He began to recall the events of the past few days. He needed to find a logical explanation for what he was seeing now. What had he missed? How could it be possible that Emma was alive? And he decided that thinking was good, but he needed to find her. He jumped up, grabbed the laptop, and ran to the car. Maybe she wouldn't have time to leave. He drove while glancing at the monitor. She stayed by the grave for a while, then left. But Oliver sped on and continued to glance at the monitor. Maybe she was still somewhere nearby. His brain started working again. He remembered how it had happened. This happened four days ago. Emma was on her way back from work and for some reason took a different route. She called him to say that she wanted to stop by a shopping center as there was a sale in her favorite store. Emma loved shopping and always kept an eye out for sales, which allowed her to buy nice things at affordable prices. That was the last time he spoke to her. Now recalling that conversation, it seemed to him that she was nervous, but maybe he was just overthinking it. Lately, she had often been out of sorts, blaming it on her workload at work. Shopping for her was like therapy, but later he received news about his wife from the police her car had veered off a bridge into the river. She had lost control. It was nighttime. Emma wasn't wearing her seatbelt. The man often scolded his wife for neglecting this, but even fines didn't scare her. She was often careless. The windshield was shattered, and Emma's body was found later by divers. Oliver went to the morgue to identify her himself. And of course, it was her in the coffin. Everyone saw that. When Oliver arrived at the cemetery, there was no one around. He walked around the grave, observing a lot of footprints that were impossible to trace. Frustrated, he hit the fence with his fist, tearing the skin and drawing blood. As he sat down, winching in pain, he noticed a receipt on the ground. He turned it over in his hands. What if she had dropped it? He went back to his car. At home, he examined the receipt and determined the store's address. It was not in the city, but in a village. Oliver decided to go there. He arrived at a relatively small village compared to the city. But how could he find her there? He couldn't just go door to door. But why not? thought Oliver, and headed to the first house. As he was about to knock, he realized he had the receipt from the store. Why not start there? At least they might recognize his wife from a photo. The saleswoman did indeed recognize Emma. She had bought a bottle of water the day before. And in fact, it seemed that this woman had recently moved to the village. She had seen her more than once. Where? Where does she live? Oliver was almost shaking with excitement. I can only guess, the chatty saleswoman happily shared her thoughts. There is a house with a yard around here. The owners were looking for someone to live there so it wouldn't be empty. Maybe that's where your woman lives. And within minutes, Oliver was speeding along the potholed road to the house. He hesitated for a few moments, then knocked on the gate. No one opened it for a long time, but it seemed to him that the curtain in the window had been moved slightly. He wasn't going to leave until he saw who lived in that house. And he waited. Emma 
came out crying and threw herself into his arms. Oliver didn't understand anything. He didn't know whether to rejoice or what to do. Later, they sat in the house and Emma told him why she was hiding there and what had happened. I had a sister, she began. Here the secrets began, of which Oliver knew nothing. Neither his wife nor her parents had ever mentioned a sister. But Emma explained that she hadn't known about her existence either. Our parents had twin girls. When they were born, it was a surprise. There wasn't much money, and our parents thought they couldn't afford to raise both. They decided to give one of us up to an orphanage. They didn't even give her a name, Emma recounted, crying. Just a month ago, I had no clue about any of this until my sister found me. One would think that such a reunion would be cause for celebration, but not in this case. Emma's sister never knew who her parents were, but at some point she decided to find her family. Nowadays, it isn't difficult. Social networks, a little money, and many secrets are revealed. By chance, she saw a photo of Emma and realized it was her sister. She found her. When I saw her, I couldn't believe my eyes, Emma said. At first, I was shocked, and then I was overjoyed. You know, it's a feeling. The woman didn't know how to express it in words. I thought it was cool. I now have a sister. Her name is Sophia. She grew up in an orphanage. Then her life didn't work out. She ended up in prison. But I felt sorry for her because our parents doomed her to such a life. She didn't want to have anything to do with our mother. She asked me not to tell her anything. She never forgave them. But I thought I had nothing to do with it. We were sisters. I still asked my mother. She told me everything. She asked how I found out. I lied that my friends told me they saw a girl who looked like me on social networks. But where and who she is, I don't know. In short, I caught my mother off guard. I thought I'd arrange a meeting between them and Sophia later. But then the nightmare began. My sister started blackmailing me. At first, she harmlessly asked for money. I gave her some, but it seemed too little to her. I offered to help her find a job, but she didn't want one. And then it turned out that she hated me because everything was good for me, while she had to survive. I understood that it was hard for her. It was a moral trauma. But she kept demanding more and more money, you know. Emma looked at her husband hopefully. I found her this little house, but it wasn't enough for her. I promised that with time, everything would work out. We would find her a job. But she didn't need that. She just wanted money for everything she had to endure. Then she threatened to take revenge on you. She said she would do terrible things to Mulaney. Emma couldn't go to the police. She didn't want her sister to end up in prison again. She wanted to help her, but she was afraid for her family. Soon, she realized that Sophia was dangerous. There was no way to reason with her peacefully. Emma began to threaten her sister with the police. A scuffle broke out between them. Sophia lunged at her sister with a knife, and in self-defense, Emma killed her. I'm facing a long prison sentence, Emma fretted. You see, I had no choice. I didn't want to kill her. I just wanted to help so she could have a good life. But she was just evil. She only wanted revenge. So Emma decided to stage her own death. A former classmate helped. He worked at a hospital, paid divers, and arranged things at the morgue. She and her sister looked as alike as two peas in a pod. No one would have looked for her, as she was a drifter in life, here today, gone tomorrow. Sadly, she had built her life in such a way that her disappearance would have gone unnoticed. Oliver was silent. He had lost his wife and found her again. He wanted to rejoice, but the reality was complicated. Emma was alive, but how could they live now? Spend their whole lives in hiding? We're safe now, Emma sadly smiled. You, me, and Mulaney. One problem solved. The woman sighed sadly. Oliver hugged his wife. I'll figure something out, he said, although he had no idea yet on how to navigate the situation, how to resurrect his wife. Emma had thrown him a complex problem. It would have been better if she had told him about her sister right away, but thank God she was alive. Oliver decided to leave everything until morning, for now, just to sleep. They had all been through stress, hard days, and they fell asleep. 
But when Oliver woke up, he didn't find his wife beside him. Damn it, he cursed. Emma decided to turn herself into the police. She saw no other way out. It was no life, constantly hiding, and she had hastily staged the scene without thinking, only considering that one day. Oliver also understood that this was the best option. It was better to hire a good lawyer and then live peacefully with a clear conscience. The investigation lasted two months. During that time, Emma was held in a detention center, worried and uncertain, as was her husband. They didn't know what to expect. Emma's sister turned out to have a dark past indeed. The charges against her were not severe, but they were borderline. Only by sheer luck had she not killed anyone else, but there had been attempts. It was this past that helped Emma prove that her actions were necessary for self-defense, to save her own life. If it weren't for her, Sophia could have killed her. The trial took place with a jury. The prosecutor asked for a 15-year sentence. However, the lawyer did an excellent job. Thanks to his professional work, all of Emma's actions were recognized as necessary self-defense. This case was one in a million. She was released from custody in the courtroom. Emma walked out of the courtroom to applause. Her mother and her husband hugged her. Both women cried. It happens in life that others have to pay for someone else's mistakes. Unfortunately, when people commit acts, they don't always assess their consequences or think that they will get away with it. Not everyone has the courage to admit their mistakes, let alone pay for them. But if you want to live with a clear conscience and fear nothing, you must do it. Emma tried to follow her mother's path to do everything better, as it seemed at a certain moment, but in time she realized that this would only lead to her living her entire life with this heavy burden, like her mother, who carried this weight in her heart and regretted her actions. She had ruined her daughter's life and ultimately could not be 100% happy herself. They decided to leave the grave as it was. Beside her father lay his biological daughter, the one he had once abandoned. They only changed the plaque on the monument and added an inscription. No matter when, the family would be together.